Welcome to the world of programming, where creativity meets logic. Programming, at its core, is the process of creating a set of instructions that computers can understand and execute. It's a powerful tool, enabling us to harness the raw computational power of machines and apply it to virtually any problem we can imagine, from creating immersive video games to powering global financial systems and even unlocking the secrets of the universe. It's a realm where every detail matters and the only limit is your imagination. The history of programming languages is as rich and diverse as the programmers who developed them. From the early days of Assembly and Fortran to the modern era of Python and JavaScript, each language was created to solve unique challenges and make our lives easier. Now that we've covered the basics, let's dive into the different types of programming languages. Programming languages are the tools we use to write programs. Picture them as the paintbrushes of the digital world, each with a unique bristle configuration for creating different strokes and textures. Broadly speaking, we have high-level languages that are user-friendly and easier to understand like Python or Java. We also have low-level languages that are closer to the machine code such as C or assembly. In the realm of programming we also talk about compiled and interpreted languages. Compiled languages like C++ are translated into machine code before running, while interpreted languages like JavaScript are translated on the fly during execution. With a plethora of languages out there, each with its strengths and ideal use cases, it's crucial to choose the right one for your project. For instance, Python is great for data analysis, while JavaScript is a go-to for web development. With the right language chosen, it's time to set up your programming environment. An integral part of programming is setting up your environment. This is where Integrated Development Environments, or IDEs, come into play. An IDE is a software application that provides comprehensive facilities to computer programmers for software development. It's your coding playground, a space where you can write, edit, debug, and run your code. Setting up a basic programming environment starts with choosing the right IDE for your chosen language. There are many options out there, from Visual Studio Code to PyCharm, each offering different features and capabilities. Once you've installed your IDE, you'll need to configure it to your liking. This might involve setting your preferred theme, customizing your workspace, or installing extensions to enhance your coding experience. Now it's time to write and run your first program. Even if it's as simple as printing Hello World to the console, it's a momentous step on your programming journey. Now that our environment is set up, let's discuss variables and data types. Variables, the building blocks of any program. Imagine them as little storage boxes that hold data. The importance of these variables is immense. They are the placeholders that keep our program's information in check. They hold the values that our program manipulates to create meaningful outcomes. Now these variables can hold different types of data. The most common ones are integers, strings, and booleans. Integers are whole numbers, strings are sequences of characters, and booleans represent true or false values. Each of these data types has its unique characteristics and uses. Declaring and using variables is like giving a name to our storage boxes and then filling them up. For instance, we might declare an integer variable named score and assign it a value of 10. Whenever we need to reference that value, we simply use the variable name score. With variables under our belt, we move on to operators and expressions. Operators and expressions, the backbone of logical operations. In the world of programming, operators are the special symbols that carry out arithmetic or logical computations. The value that the operator operates on is called the operand. We have various types of operators like arithmetic operators which include addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Then we have logical operators. These are used to determine the logic between variables or values. True or false, yes or no, logical operators answer these questions. Now, let's talk about expressions. An expression is a combination of variables, operators, and values that yield a result value. Like in mathematics, expressions are evaluated to produce a single output. They are the building blocks of any programming construct. You'll find them in conditions, loops, and even functions. So, operators and expressions together form the logic of our programs. They are the tools that help our programs make decisions and carry out tasks. Now that we understand expressions, let's explore control structures. Control structures, guiding the flow of your program. Imagine them as the traffic lights of coding, directing the flow of information and making sure everything runs smoothly. One of the key types of control structures is conditional statements. These are the if, else, and switch statements you probably have come across. 
They allow your program to make decisions based on certain conditions. Then we have loops, the for, while, and do while structures. These are the workhorses of your code, repeating tasks until a certain condition is met. Understanding these control structures is fundamental to making your code efficient and effective. Remember, good flow control in programming is like a well-conducted orchestra. Every part knows when to play and when to stop, creating a harmonic symphony of code. Having mastered control structures, we delve into functions and procedures. Functions. The reusable sections of our program. Now let's dive a bit deeper. Picture functions as the building blocks of a program, each performing a specific task. We define a function once, and then call it whenever we need that task done. It's like having a personal assistant always ready to perform a task on command. Each function can take parameters which are like instructions or information it needs to complete its task. For instance, a function to add two numbers would need those two numbers as parameters. After doing its job, a function can return a value, like the result of an addition. But where do these functions live? They exist within a scope, which defines where a function or a variable can be accessed from. It's like their home within your code. And just like us, functions have a lifetime. They're born when defined, alive when called, and die when they've done their job. Having understood functions, let's move to arrays and collections. Arrays and collections, the containers of our data. Hold on to your hats, folks, because this is where things get really interesting. Imagine you're a librarian and you've got all these books, your data. Now you could just pile them up in a corner, but that's not very efficient, is it? No, you need shelves. In programming, those shelves are arrays and other collections. An array is like a row of shelves. Each shelf can hold one book, and you can find any book instantly if you know its position on the shelf. But what if your library grows? Well, you can use other collections like lists, which are like arrays, but can grow and shrink as needed. Then there are dictionaries, which are like having a magical index that can take you directly to the book you want. And the best part? You can loop through these collections, checking or changing every book in turn. Now that we've covered arrays, let's explore basic input and output. Input and output, the communication channels of our program. Let's start with the console, the programmer's best friend. Reading from and writing to the console is as fundamental as it gets. Here, you can enter data, display results, or even print out messages to help debug your code. Next, let's talk about file handling. It's all about reading data from files or writing data to files. Imagine you're working with a huge data set. Instead of manually entering every single data point, you can simply read it from a file. Likewise, if you need to save your results for later, you can write them to a file. Finally, handling user input is another crucial aspect of programming. Whether it's a simple command line argument or a complex form in a web application, being able to process user input effectively is key. With I.O. covered, we move to error handling and debugging. Error handling and debugging the cleanup crew of programming. Like a detective at a crime scene, a programmer needs to identify, understand, and rectify mistakes in the code. These mistakes, known as errors or exceptions, come in various forms. Syntax errors, for instance, are like grammatical errors in a sentence, while runtime errors occur when the program is running, often due to unexpected user input or logical flaws. But worry not, as every Sherlock has his methods, so do programmers. Debugging techniques are the tools in our investigative kit. Breakpoints, for example, allow us to pause the program at specific lines of code and inspect the values of variables at that point. Writing robust and error-free code may seem like a Herculean task. However, with proper error handling techniques like using try-catch blocks to anticipate and manage exceptions, we can create resilient programs. Remember, a well-handled error is an opportunity for a program to gracefully recover instead of crashing abruptly. Now that we've covered error handling, let's delve into object-oriented programming basics. Object-oriented programming, a paradigm that revolutionized programming. It introduced us to concepts like classes, objects, and inheritance. A class is like a blueprint, detailing the characteristics and behaviors that an object of that class will have. Objects are instances of these classes, actual entities in your code that interact with one another. Then, we have encapsulation, a principle that bundles data and the methods that operate on that data within the same unit. This hides complexity and safeguards data integrity. Abstraction lets us focus on the essential features of an object while ignoring its less relevant details. It simplifies complex systems by breaking them down into manageable parts. Polymorphism, on the other hand, allows objects to take on many forms, 
making our code more flexible and intuitive. Through simple examples like creating a class for a car and making different car objects, we can see these principles in action. We hope you've enjoyed this journey into the basics of programming. So there you have it, the basics of programming. We've journeyed through the realms of programming languages, IDEs, variables, data types, operators, control structures, functions, arrays, basic I.O., error handling, debugging, and the basics of object-oriented programming. Remember, each concept is a stepping stone to the next, forming a foundation for you to build upon. Thanks for joining us today. Stay curious, keep learning, and happy programming.